Hi, I'm Chandralekha Singh from University of Pittsburgh. I'm also the current president of the American Association of Physics Teachers, and I'm delighted to be your instructor today for this unit on magnetism. Let's get started. So today, we are going to actually learn about force on a charge particle in a magnetic field, how a velocity selector works, trajectory of a charge particle in a uniform magnetic field, how a mass spectrometer works, and force on a very long straight current carrying wire in a magnetic field. All right, here we go. So let's first think about the magnetic force on a moving charge particle in an external magnetic field. So let's say we have a charge Q0, which is moving with a velocity V in a uniform magnetic field B. And the question is, what is the magnetic force on it? It turns out that the magnetic force F of M on this is going to be Q0 times V cross B, the cross product of the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector. And the magnitude of this particular force is given by Q0, the magnitude of velocity vector, which is the speed, times the magnitude of magnetic field, times the sine of the angle between the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector. What about the direction? It turns out that the cross product of two vectors is always perpendicular to each of these vectors. So in this case, the force vector is going to be perpendicular to both the velocity of the charged particle and to the magnetic field in which the charged particle is moving. And that is the reason why when we are thinking about magnetism, we need to start visualizing things in three dimensions. Now, in order to think about force vector, which is perpendicular to both velocity vector and the magnetic field vector, let's first think about a plane in which the velocity vector and magnetic field vector both lie because the force vector will definitely be perpendicular to whatever plane in which velocity and magnetic field vector lie. It's either going to be you know, perpendicular to the plane one way or the other way. And which of the two ways it is, is can be found by using what is called the right-hand rule for the cross product. So let's think about two cases here. So here is one case. In this particular case, I have a charged particle that has a velocity in this direction in the plane of this computer and the magnetic field in this direction. And the angle between them is theta, right? And you can see that both the magnetic field vector and velocity vector in this case are in the plane of this computer. And so you know that the magnetic force that this charged particle is feeling due to this magnetic field is going to be either out of this computer or into the computer, right? Same in this situation, except that now I, the, the velocity vector is this way and the magnetic field vector is this way. Still the two, case, two things are in the plane of this computer. And so the force vector on this charged particle is going to be either out of this computer screen or into the computer screen. Now, which of these it is can be found by using the right-hand rule. So let's learn the right-hand rule. So here is how I would uh, do it. You should put all the fingers of your right hand in the direction of the velocity vector, and then sweep your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field vector, and then your thumb will point in the direction of the force vector. Now, notice that you've already decided that there are only two possible directions to the force, right? It's either out of the computer or into the computer. We are just trying to figure out which of these two it is. So let's try it for case one here, where this is the velocity vector and this is the magnetic field vector. And as I said, put your, fi put your fingers of the right hand, that means this, these things in the direction of the velocity vector, right? You, do you see it? And then sweep it in the direction of the magnetic field vector. And do you see that my thumb is coming towards me? So that means it's coming out of the computer screen. And so this in this particular case, the force will be coming out at me. And basically, a vector that is coming out at us can be represented with a dot. So that means we are just seeing that, you know, it's like the pointy thing of this, this particular pen, for example. We are seeing some vector that is pointing towards us. Now, in the second case, again, we'll do the same thing. And in this case, again, put, put our fingers in the direction of the velocity vector, sweep it in the direction of the magnetic field vector. Do you see that my thumb is actually going into the computer screen in this case? 
So in case two here, the force magnetic force vector is actually into the computer screen. Again, I would say at this point, you should stop this video and try to do it yourself. Put your fingers in the direction of the velocity vector and sweep it in the direction of the magnetic field vector. Notice that in this particular, in the second case, I put my fingers like this in the direction of velocity vector because I was supposed to sweep it in the direction of magnetic field like this. And my thumb was going into the computer screen. Whereas in the first case, I put it this way because I was supposed to sweep it this way. The, the magnetic field is actually here. And so I did it like this. And you can see that the magnetic force is coming towards me. So in case one, the magnetic field is coming out of the screen. In case two, the magnetic field is going into the screen. Before we move on, I also wanted to actually uh, remind you that the SI unit of magnetic field is going to be the same as the unit of force divided by the unit of charge di divided by the unit of velocity vector or velocity or speed divided by sine theta. Now sine theta does not have any unit, right? So really the SI unit of magnetic field which is, give, which is called Tesla and, and is written as T is going to be the unit of force, which is Newton, divided by the unit of charge, which is Coulomb, and the unit of velocity, which is meters per second. And if you take the seconds to the top here, it'll become one Tesla is one Newton second per Coulomb meter. All right, so now get ready for some concept questions for you. And for these concept questions, I really very strongly recommend that after I ask these questions, you pause the video, you think about them for some time, and then you let's discuss the answer together. All right, so here is the first question. It says the magnetic force on a charged particle is in the direction of its velocity. If it's moving in the direction of the field, if it's moving opposite to the direction of the field, if it's moving perpendicular to the field, if it's moving in some other direction, never. Pause the video, think about the answer, and then come back because when you have struggled with it, you are really going to get a lot more out of the discussion. All right, I hope that you actually thought about the answer. It turns out that the correct answer here is the force on a charged particle is in the direction of its velocity never. Remember, we discussed that magnetic force is very interesting. It is actually always perpendicular to the velocity vector. And it's also always perpendicular to the magnetic field vector. So if it's always perpendicular to the velocity vector, then it can never be in the direction of the velocity vector. So the correct answer here is never. All right, let's think about the next concept question. This one says, an electron is moving east in a region where the magnetic field is west. The magnetic force exerted on the electron is zero, north, south, is it in the east direction or west direction? All right, pause the video, think about it yourself first, and then we'll discuss it together. All right, I hope you got a chance to think about it yourself. The correct answer here is zero. Because if an electron is moving east and the magnetic field is west, let's think about what would be the angle theta between the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector. It's gonna be 180 degrees because they are anti-parallel to each other. And sine of 180 degrees is zero. And so a charged particle that is actually moving in a magnetic field, anti-parallel to the field, feels absolutely no magnetic force. What about a charged particle that is moving parallel to the magnetic field? So let's say that the magnetic field was west and the charged particle is also moving in the west direction. Will there be a magnetic force on it? The answer is no, because in that case, again, sine theta will be sine of zero because the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector are pointing in the same direction and sine of zero is also zero. So sine of zero is zero, sine of nine, uh, 180 degrees is zero. So for both sine zero and sine 180, the force will be zero. So that means whether the charged particle is moving parallel or anti-parallel to the magnetic field, the force on it is going to be zero. Here's another question for you. What happens if the charged particle is at rest in a magnetic field? Does it feel a force? You got it. 
The correct answer is, since the charged particle is at rest, its velocity is zero, so there cannot be any magnetic force. So notice that nature behaves in a very interesting way. The magnetic force will be zero if the charged particle is at rest, or if it's moving parallel or anti-parallel to the magnetic field, but only if the charged particle is moving at any other angle will there be a magnetic force. Remember, this is very different from the electric force. If you recall, we had earlier learned that electric force was F is equal to QE. So electric force is always going to be parallel or anti-parallel to the electric field, depending upon whether the charged particle is positive or negative. So these are very different kinds of forces. Nature is indeed very fun. All right, so get ready for another concept question. This one is, says an electron with an initial velocity V enters a region with uniform magnetic field, which is directed into the page. So in this case, by page, I mean into the computer. And I'm showing the crosses to mean that the magnetic field is pointed into the computer. The velocity of the electron is perpendicular to the magnetic field as shown. The direction of the magnetic force exerted on the electron right after it enters the field is to the left, to the right, into the screen, out of the screen, or there is no magnetic force on this particle. Stop the video, think about it, and then come back and we'll discuss it. All right, I hope that you got a chance to think about it. It turns out that in this case, the magnetic force on this electron is to the right. And again, we have to think about this particular relation between the magnetic force, its velocity, and its magnetic field, and the magnetic field in which it's moving. Also notice we need to think about whether this charge is positive or negative, because if the charge is negative, which is the case for the electron, then the direction of the force vector is going to be opposite to what your right-hand rule is going to suggest, because right-hand rule is just giving you the direction of V cross B. So let's first figure out what would be the direction of V cross B here, and then we will actually use the opposite direction because in this case, for the electron, this is going to be a negative charge. So notice that the velocity of this electron is up and the magnetic field is into the page. So again, I have to put my, all the fingers of my right hand in the direction of velocity vector. Any of these is good, so long as I have it up. These are all good direction, but then I have to actually cross it in the direction or sweep it in the direction of the magnetic field, which is pointing into the computer. Do you see that my thumb is pointing this way? And that means for a positive charge, the force will be to the left this way, the direction which my thumb is pointing. But since this is electron, whatever this V cross B, the right hand rule is suggesting, the direction will be opposite due to the negative charge of the electron. And that is the direction, right direction. So the correct answer would be right direction. I hope that makes sense to you, that when I put my fingers in the direction of velocity vector, notice that these things should be in the direction of velocity vector and any of these is appropriate. But since the magnetic field was pointing in, I have to sweep it like this and then the force vector is this way for a positive charge and the force vector will be opposite for a negative charge. All right. I hope you're ready for another concept question. This one says, the figure shows two situations in which a positively charged particle moving with a velocity V through a uniform magnetic field B experiences a magnetic force F sub B due to the field. Which orientations are physically reasonable? That means they are not impossible situations that nature would never allow us. So here are your choices. Pause the video, think about it, and then we'll discuss it. All right, welcome back. So it turns out the correct answer here is neither of these situations is reasonable. Why? Well, again, we have to go back to the thing that we learned that the force on a charged particle is basically Q0 V cross B. And this force is always perpendicular to the velocity vector. And it's also perpendicular to the magnetic field vector. Now notice that the first situation that we have been shown, the angle between the velocity vector and the magnetic force vector is 45 degrees. Obviously this is not possible because velocity vector and magnetic force vector must always be at 90 degrees. This is how nature works. We cannot defy the laws of physics. 
Similarly, in this case, the force vector and the magnetic field vector are at 45 degrees. Again, not possible because you can see that the force vector must be perpendicular to the magnetic field vector. Now notice that the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector can be at any angle to each other because you have the choice of launching your particle at some velocity at any angle to the magnetic field, right? So you can actually choose the, the, the relative direction of V and B and that is fine, that's what is theta, but you don't have any control over what would be the direction of the force vector compared to velocity or compared, or compared to the magnetic field. So you cannot have these two things be at 45 degrees. You cannot be the force and magnetic field be at 45 degrees because this particular law of nature is showing us that the force vector must be perpendicular to the velocity and must be perpendicular to the magnetic field. And these two are violating it. Notice V and B, speed and the velocity and the magnetic field can be at any angle. So it's important to remember that. All right. Here is one more concept question, just to make sure you have it all right. And you can actually connect it back to what you learned about uh, electric force. Remember, F of E was Q times E, where E is the electric force. So this question says, an electron enters a region with uniform perpendicular electric and magnetic fields. And it is observed that the velocity V of the electron is unaffected. A possible explanation is, that the velocity is parallel to the electric field and it has a magnitude E over B. The electron is moving slowly so that the electric and magnetic fields do not affect its motion. The velocity is parallel to the magnetic field and has a magnitude E over B. The velocity is perpendicular to both E and B and has a magnitude E over B. And the given situation is impossible. Pause this video, think about it and then come back and we'll discuss it. All right, I hope you got a chance to think about it. It turns out that the correct answer here is velocity, when velocity is perpendicular to both E and B and has a magnitude E over B, it is possible to actually see that the velocity of the electron is unaffected by this particular uh, combination of electric and magnetic field. And in fact, this particular situation is what people call a velocity selector. So let's discuss what a velocity selector is. In this situation, I have both electric and magnetic field. So notice that this one here is showing a very long parallel plate capacitor, right? Where the electric field is from the positive to the negative charge. This is the direction of the electric field pointing down here. And this electric field is pretty uniform because these plates are almost infinite. The magnetic field here is actually uniform and it's pointing into the computer. So by uniform, I mean it's constant everywhere and it's pointing into the computer. Now, if suppose I send a whole bunch of charged particle through this electric and magnetic field combination and they are all moving at different speed, let's say, and these are all positively charged particle, what do you think will happen? Well, the electric force on the charged particle, let's think about each force separately. And then we are going to think about the superposition principle and the net force will be the net effect of both the electric force and the magnetic force on this charged particle. So these charged particles at different speeds are just shooting into this particular uh, space where there is an electric field pointing down and magnetic field going into the computer. Now the electric force on this charged particle is just Q zero or Q times E. So it's going to be in the direction of electric field since this is a positive charge. So you can see this arrow here is showing the direction of the electric field on this charged particle. Now the magnetic field, what is the magnetic force on this charged particle? Well, since the magnetic field is pointing into the computer, let's use our right hand rule again we put all of the fingers of, my, of our right hand in the direction of the velocity vector. Notice you have to use the right hand and then sweep it in the direction of magnetic field, which is going into the computer. Do you see my thumb is going up? And so in this particular case, I can see that the magnetic force on this positively charged particle is pointing up, right? 
And it makes sense because the magnetic force vector is perpendicular to the velocity vector. And it's also perpendicular to the magnetic field, which is going into the computer. So if the magnetic force is pointing up, remember its magnitude is going to be Q V B times sine of the angle between the velocity and the magnetic field vector. Now your velocity vector is that way uh, to the right and the magnetic field is pointing into the computer. So the angle between the two is 90 and sine of 90 is actually one. So basically it just turns out to be QVB is the magnitude of the magnetic force due to sine 90 being one. So now think about it. You know, it's possible that if the charged particle is moving very slowly, then Q sub E is more than QVB, in which case the charged particle ha will have a net force pointing down and uh, because the electric field is stronger and it's exerting a stronger force. If the charged particle has a larger velocity than a certain value, then the charged magnetic force will win out over the electric force and the charged particle might actually deviate up. But can you imagine that there will be a particular situation at which Q sub E, Q, sorry, Q times E, will become exactly equal to QVB. So the force pointing up this magnetic force on this charged particle in this region where there is both electric and magnetic field will be exactly equal to the electric force that is pointing down. And if the electric force QE becomes equal to QVB, in that case, you can see that this charged particle actually feels no net force. And if there is no net force, remember, there is not going to be any acceleration of the charged particle. Its velocity is not going to be changing. So neither its magnitude will change nor its direction. So this charged particle will be totally oblivious of the presence of the electric field and it'll just keep going through. La la la. So in this case, this particular combination actually picks out that particular velocity for which QE is, is exactly equal to QVB. And notice that this situation is, uh, is going to happen when V becomes equal to E divided by B. And that is what the previous question was asking you, right? And so this is a situation where even if you were sending particles with lots of different velocities, you have picked out the particle with one particular velocity because that is the only one that's going to be undeviated and you can collect it over here for whatever purpose you wanted to collect it to, for. And we can see later that we are going to use this thing for what is called mass spectrometer, which is a device that is used by scientists often to actually separate particles. So let's actually think about that later. But here I have another concept question for you before that. This one says, which one of the following statements is true about the work done by the magnetic force on a charged particle moving with a velocity V in a uniform magnetic field B? It's always positive, it's always negative, it's always zero. It can be positive or negative depending upon whether the charge is positive or negative. And it can be positive or negative depending upon the orientation of the initial velocity with respect to the field. Pause the video, think about it, and then we'll discuss it. All right, I hope you got a chance to think about it. It turns out the correct answer here is that the magnetic force on a charged particle does not do any work. So the question is, why is it that the magnetic force actually does not do work? Let's look at the definition of work. So work done by the magnetic force can be written as the dot product of the magnetic force vector and the displacement vector of the charged particle, right? Remember that? And so the dot product is the magnitude of the force vector, the magnitude of the displacement vector times the cosine of the angle between the force vector and the displacement vector. Now, if you really think about what we just learned about the force on the charged particle and the velocity of the charged particle, one of the things that you have to recognize is that the displacement vector is always going to be parallel to the instantaneous velocity of the particle, right? On the other hand, the magnetic force vector is always perpendicular to the direction of velocity because its magnetic force was Q zero V cross B. So it's always perpendicular to the velocity vector. So notice displacement vector is parallel to the instantaneous velocity. 
the force vector is perpendicular to it. So that means displacement and force are always at 90 degrees to each other. So this theta is 90 degrees. And cosine of 90 is always zero. And that means the magnetic force is no, never going to do work because cosine of 90 is always going to be uh, zero. So that means that magnetic force is never going to change the speed of the particle, right? Does that make, make sense? What it can only do is change the direction of the velocity, not the magnitude of the velocity. So let's think about that. And now we are going to think about the motion of a charged particle in a uniform magnetic field. And let's consider a simpler situation first. This is the situation in which the velocity of the charged particle is perpendicular to the magnetic field, which is uniform or constant. And this situation gives rise to what you can call uniform circular motion. That means motion of a charged particle at constant speed in a circle. Why does this happen? Let's think about it. Let's look at this situation here. Here, let's, let's say that this was the point where you started the charged particle. So there was a magnetic field that was pointing into the computer screen here. And that's what I have shown here with crosses. And this is uniform everywhere. That means the same everywhere. Now, if I launch a charged particle with speed V here, tell me which way will be the force on this charged particle? Well, we have to use our right hand rule. Put all the fingers of your right hand in the direction of the velocity. Any of these is good, so long as the fingers are pointing in the direction of the velocity. But then I have to cross my fingers or sweep my fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, which is pointing into the computer. Do you see my thumb is pointing towards left? So that means the force at this point, magnetic force is pointing this way, all right? And this makes sense because the magnetic force should be perpendicular to the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector, right? Now, at any point, you can check yourself, just use your right hand rule and you'll see like at any point, like let's say if the particle has come here, again, you can use the right hand rule to figure out what would be the direction of the force on this charged particle. And again, put your fingers of the right hand in the direction of the velocity, sweep it in the direction of the magnetic field. And you can see that your thumb is again going to point in the direction like this, which is perpendicular to the velocity vector. So, and similarly over here, put your fingers in the direction of the velocity vector, sweep it in the direction of the magnetic field vector, your thumb is pointing up. So that's the direction of the force. Notice that at all of these points, the force is perpendicular to the velocity. So the force cannot change the magnitude of velocity. And that is why we were saying that the magnetic force does not do work. But this force can actually change the direction of velocity. And that is why this charged particle speed is constant. This force is only change tilting it, only tilting it. And that's why this charged particle is actually moving in a circle at a constant speed. Not constant velocity, constant speed. That there's a difference because speed is constant, but velocity is changing because the direction of velocity is changing, not the magnitude of velocity, right? And so when we say that particle is moving in a circle at constant speed, it is the magnitude of velocity that is constant as the particle goes through a circle. Now, in this situation, you might ask, oh, can we figure out what should be the radius of this circle in which this, charge, in which this charged particle is moving? And the answer is yes. And the way we will find it is we can make use of Newton's second law. Remember, Newton's second law said, net force is mass times acceleration. And here, I am thinking about centripetal acceleration because this magnetic force is really actually creating a force towards the center of the circle because notice that velocity of the particle is always tangent to the path and the force is perpendicular to it. So force must be towards the center of the circle at each point. And so these, this magnetic force is really the centripetal force, right? Centripetal force is really coming due to the magnetic force in this case. And that's giving rise to mass times acceleration of this particle. And this acceleration has a magnitude V square over R. Remember learning this? Okay, so if that's the case, then we can actually make use of the fact that the magnitude of the magnetic force is mass times the magnitude of the acceleration V square over R. But we know that we learned that the magnitude of the force 
is Q times V times B times sine of the angle between the V velocity vector and the magnetic field vector. But here velocity vector is at all the points, you know, in the plane of the computer and the magnetic field vector is perpendicular to it. So do you see that the angle between them is 90 degree and sine of 90 is one. So it just turns out to be magnetic force is just QVB. And now using this equation, we can cancel one power of V. And so we are left with MV over R is equal to QB. And then simplifying for R, we can get R is equal to MV divided by QB. So you can see that the radius with, uh, in which this charged particle is moving, the radius of the circle in which this charged particle is moving in a uniform magnetic field is dependent on the particle's mass, its velocity, its speed, its charge, and the magnetic field strength. Now, what about the angular speed of the charged particle? Remember, angular speed is linear speed divided by the radius. V is equal to R omega, right? So we can figure out the angular speed. We can also figure out, by, by the way, angular speed is related to frequency because frequency is the number of cycles per second. And omega is basically two pi times the frequency. But let's figure out what is the period of revolution. Period of revolution is how many, um, how much time does it take for this charged particle to make one loop? Let's call it capital T. That's basically going to be either two pi, or, or you can write it as two pi over omega, or you can just call it the circumference of the circle, two pi r divided by the speed, right? Two pi r is the circumference divided by the speed with which this is moving because it's a constant speed case. That's gonna be the period and if you just use R over V from here, R divided by V here was M divided by QB. As soon as I put it here, I see that the period is two pi M over QB. Notice something very interesting. The period of this charge particle, that means the time it takes to make one lap does not depend upon how large the radius is. It doesn't even depend upon the speed of the particle. And that is because it, actually as the speed of the charged particle increases, the radius increases such that the period stays constant, right? So the point is that R over V is actually a constant in this case, so long as the mass of the particle, the charge of the particle and the magnetic field strength is constant. So the period only depends upon these three things and not on R or V independently because it just depends upon this ratio and if you know, you launch the charged particle at a higher speed, its radius is going to increase for a given um, mass, charge, and magnetic field. I hope this makes sense. All right, let's move forward. So now let's think about this application that is really actually very useful because mass spectrometer is a device that is used by scientists all the time for separating particles with different mass but for the same charge. So for example, different isotopes of an element. So isotopes of an element are, are those things that have the same exact uh, number of protons, but the number of neutrons is going to be different in the nucleus. So notice if the number of neutrons is different, the mass of the particle will be different. But if the number of protons is the same, then uh, the, num the charge of that thing is going to be the same if for example, you kick out a couple of electrons from these. So let's say that you know we wanted to make a mass spectrometer, we can actually do it by a combination of a velocity selector and a region in which there is only magnetic field. So remember, we just talked about a velocity selector and we said that that requires you to have an electric field, for example, through a parallel plate capacitor in which this could be the positively charged plate and this could be the negatively charged plate and a magnetic field which is pointing into the computer. And the point is that in this crossed electric and magnetic field, we said that there will be a certain velocity that will be undeflected, right? Remember that? For which Q sub QE was equal to QVB. That is the case for which the velocity was undeflected and the, it just kept going straight through as though you know, it was completely oblivious of the presence of the electric and magnetic fields because the net force on it was zero. Now, what happens if we make a little hole and now let that particular charged particle, let's say that this is a positively charged particle, 
actually go through this hole into a region where there was only magnetic field. In this case, now let's think about it. As soon as you, this charged particle now reaches this region, its velocity is pointing to the right, right? And the magnetic field is shown with these crosses. That's, that means that it's pointing into the computer. So let's use our right hand rule. Velocity is this way. The magnetic field is into the computer. Do you see my thumb is pointing this way? So this charged particle is actually going to feel a force this way and it is going to, and similarly, if it came over here, it's go, the velocity vector is going to be tangent to the path over here and the force and the magnetic field is pointing in. Again, the force vector will be, you know, towards the center of the circle. And so at every point, the velocity vector and the um, magnetic field vector are going to be perpendicular and they are going to be uh, actually uh, causing a force which is pointing towards the center of this circle. So this particle will move in a circle. But the question is, what's the radius of this circle? The radius of this circle, if you remember, what would be mv over qb. So if they all have the same velocity, if they are all moving in the same magnetic field and they have the same charge, but they have different masses because they are different isotopes and they have different number of neutrons in the nucleus, then the radii of those circles is going to be different. One of them will be this big, one of them will be this big, one of them will be greater than this. And so you can actually select out or separate out the different isotopes of different masses. And that is why this device that actually does this is called a mass spectrometer. So you can see that the magnetic field was very useful in making this device. All right, so here is another concept question for you. It says, a proton with speed v enters a region with a uniform magnetic field of magnitude b. The velocity of the proton makes an angle theta with the magnetic field. Which of the following choices best describes the path of the proton after it enters this region? So here is the figure that you can look at. Is it helical motion with the pitch of the helix along the direction of the magnetic field? Is it circular motion perpendicular to the plane of the page? The plane of the circle is perpendicular to the magnetic field. Is it circular motion perpendicular to the plane of the page? The plane of the circle is at an angle theta to the magnetic field. Does it continue along a straight line in the direction of the initial velocity? Or is this situation impossible? Again, stop the video for a second. Think about it, or more than a second. Think about it, and then come back. And then we'll discuss it. Then you'll learn the most. All right. I hope you got a chance to think about it. So it turns out the correct answer here is that the motion of this charged particle is going to be helical motion with the pitch of the helix along the direction of the magnetic field. In order to think about it, let's actually again look at the situation that we had looked at earlier. This was a situation in which the velocity of the charged particle was actually perpendicular to the magnetic field in which it was launched, right? And we said this case in which the velocity is perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic field, like in this case, will cause uniform circular motion. That means the charged particle will move, keep moving in a circle at a constant speed. Now, in this particular case, what we see is that if you take one cross section, I want you to take one cross section and think in three dimensions. So notice that the magnetic field here is actually pointing into the computer, right? And if I take a slice of this thing here, what will you see? You will see that the velocity that the magnetic field is in and the velocity vector is this way and this charged particle starts moving in a circle like this. This is not that different from a situation like this here, which is what is given to us in which we can actually decompose or break up this velocity vector into two components, the x component and the y component. Now think about it. The x component of this velocity of this particle is in the direction of the magnetic field. Will it cause any magnetic force on the charged particle? No, because remember f is equal to q0 v cross b. And so the com component of velocity that is parallel to the magnetic field cannot cause any magnetic force. So this component of velocity is going to be unchanged for this charged particle. That just remains the same, Vx. But at the same time, this charged particle also has a component of velocity Vy. What will that component do? 
Well, let's use our right hand rule that Vy crossed with the magnetic field. Do you see Vy cross B? B is pointing to the uh, right this time. My thumb is going into the board or into the screen, computer screen here. And so in this case, as soon as this charged particle enters the field, it feels a force inward. And what it'll do is it'll make the charged particle move in a circle like this. If this X component was zero, if this X component was completely zero, in this case, can you see that this VY will make the charged particle move in a circle just like this? It'll keep going in and out of the computer like this, right? Because this situation is not going to be different than from that uniform circular motion that we talked about in the previous slide. But the only difference here is that this also has an X component of velocity that is staying constant. So, you know, I have two things that are, that are you know, stuck with me. One is the Y component of velocity that is actually changing with time because its direction keeps changing and the particle wants to make a circle because of this magnetic force. But then the X component of velocity keeps moving it forward. And that's why what will happen then is it'll move in a helix like this. It'll keep coming in and out of the computer screen, but it'll form a helix. Now, the pitch of the helix is basically given by the magnitude of the X component of the velocity, which is the X component here, the speed, uh, times the period of one revolution here, right? The two, you know, that will tell you how much distance it would have moved before it makes one lap, right? So Vx times the period T that we had calculated earlier using this component of velocity, Vy, which is the one that is making it move in a circle, will actually uh, be the thing that actually um, be the pitch. So, so pitch will be Vx times the period T. Do you remember that we had calculated the period earlier for, the, for this kind of, for this charged particle? Period was really two pi R of the circle divided by V, right? And you can actually figure this out in terms of mass, charge, and B using this equation here. All right. So I hope that you understand that this is going to be moving in a helix with the pitch of the helix in the direction of the magnetic field because the pitch is going to be given by Vx times the period T. All right. So this is my last slide. And I just wanted to actually remind you of something that you've done earlier, which is that if current carrying wires are really charges in motion, then shouldn't a current carrying wire be feeling a force if you put it in an external magnetic field? And the answer is yes. So if, uh, you know, and let's only consider the case of a very, very long straight current carrying wire like this, you know, and this is a wire that is carrying current this way to the left, and it's in a magnetic field that is shown to be coming out at us. So basically it's coming out at the computer screen. And if you remember from what we had learned earlier, the current is really charged per unit time, right? So th for passing through any cross section of this wire. So if you, you know, think about one cross section of the wire anywhere, whatever is charge is flowing per unit time, is basically the current, the current right? And the, the unit of current was unit of charge divided by time, coulomb per second is the ampere. So those things you know, but now I want to think about what is the force on this current carrying wire in this external magnetic field? You, let's use what we already know. So we know that force on a charge particle in an external magnetic field is given by Q0 V cross B. And if this current is really due to really mo motion of free electrons in one way, but we think about you know, this current flowing in the opposite direction to the flow of electrons, so you can think of some hypothetical positive charges moving that way, even though the current is due to the flow of negative charges, we can actually now write the same equation like this. We can divide by time and we can multiply by time and we can say Q0 over T is the current and V times T is some length element and length element is along the direction of the current at any you know, small segment. But in this case, I'm only looking at very long straight current carrying wire. So the entire length element is basically pointing to the le left here. And so you can see that then the force be basically becomes 
L cross B times I, the current in the current carrying wire. And so the magnitude of this force will become I L B times sine theta. Now, for the case that I'm showing you, the current is flowing that way and the magnetic field is coming out at us. So the angle between the two is 90 degrees. So sine 90 is one. So the force has a magnitude, which is I L B in this particular situation for a long straight current carrying wire. And let's figure out the direction. What, again, use the right hand rule. It's the same right hand rule. This time you have to do L cross B. Put all of your fingers in the direction of the length element, which is in the direction in which the current is flowing in this wire and sweep it in the direction of magnetic field, which is coming out at you. And do you see that your thumb is pointing up? So the force on this current carrying wire due to this magnetic field that is coming out at us is actually pointing up. Do it yourself. Put your fingers in the direction of the current, sweep it in the direction of field, and you can see that the current is going up, right? Try to do some problems related to current carrying wires. All right, I really had a good time teaching you. I hope you had a good time. Thank you so much and all the very best for everything.